Hey guys, enter the stars and welcome to the show tonight. We are live. We've got a good show tonight. We're going to talk about Orion, mentioned in the Bible three separate times. Orion, the constellation. We're also going to talk about the amniotic amnesia of the womb. And finally, we're going to discuss what it really means when Jesus told the disciple to catch a fish and find the coin in its mouth. Now, this is going to be one of those shows where we're going to go deep, deep into the truth. And if you're ready to understand and know the truth, then you are in the right place this evening. I'll be sharing screens in just a moment. But I pose to you the question. If suicide became fashionable and everyone started jumping off of buildings, would you say that this is a progressive idea? How about if everyone started chopping off their pinky finger and that became fashionable? Would you follow the crowd? Would you accept these behaviors as normal and consider them as an option just because it becomes a trend? And I think the answer to that is obviously no. But yet in this reality, we exist to follow trends. It seems as though anything that is put in front of our faces on a camera or talked about by a celebrity or endorsed by someone, it becomes something that people consider as an option. And from that standpoint, we are actually, as a human race, somewhat weak. Now I'm going to share screens and we're going to get into some of this deep truth tonight. Now we've got three different subjects tonight that we're going to be presenting to you guys. And the first one, I took some notes here, is Nimrod the Nephilim. Now when I began digging into Orion, the way I came about doing this was I was looking at the Bible, and in the Bible where they had mentioned the word Orion three separate times. Now, the one that most people know about is in Job, and God is speaking to Job, and he says to him, basically, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, the Lord speaks to Job from a storm. And the storm is significant. And we'll get into that as well. But down here in verse 31, he says, Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? So God had already given these constellations names. And this is important because oftentimes people see the naming of constellations as astrological. I do not believe in astrology. I don't believe that we're supposed to run our lives based on the stars. But I do believe we're to look to the stars for signs because the Bible tells us to. Okay, There's a big difference between astronomy and astrology. Okay, Very big difference. He, said, he then says to Job, do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Now, this is interesting because as I began reading about Orion, I also saw that Orion was mentioned in other parts of the Bible. Let me see where I had that pulled up at. Job was the first one. Let's go ahead and uh, do a page search for Job. It says here, uh, he is the maker of the bear and Orion. In Job 9.9, 9, Job 38.31, we just read, says, can you loosen Orion's belt? And in Amos 5.8, he who made the Pleiades and Orion. Now, in this verse, this is fascinating because binding the chain of the Pleiades is actually really happening. And the belt of Orion is actually being loosened. Let me pull that up for you guys real quick. Because I could not believe. That 
that this was actually true. But in fact, the astronomy in the book of Job is scientifically consistent. Now, I've done a video in the past on this, but they basically go through in this website, Cold Case Christianity, and they demonstrate how, in fact, the Pleiades are being bound and that Orion is being loosened. Let's go through this here. I'm going to put this link in the chat. Appreciate all you guys showing up tonight, those of you who hunger for truth. Now, you would think this would be front page news, but if it was, it would validate the Bible. And they don't want that. The text refers to three constellations, Pleiades, Orion, and Arcturus. The fourth, Maseroth, is still unknown to us. In the first part of the verse, God challenged Job's ability to bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades. As it turns out, the Pleiades is an open star cluster in the constellation of Taurus. It is classified as an open cluster because it is a group of hundreds of stars formed from the same cosmic cloud. They are approximately the same age and have roughly the same chemical composition. Most importantly, they are bound to one another by mutual gravitational attraction, just as God said they were, bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades. But this goes on. He also talks about Orion. God challenged Job again and says, can you loosen the belt of Orion? Orion's belt is formed by two stars, Alnilam and Mintaka, and one star cluster, Alnitak. Alnitak is actually a triple star system at the eastern edge of Orion's belt. These stars are not gravitationally bound like those in the Pleiades. Instead, the stars of Orion belt are heading in different directions. Loosening the belt of Orion. How did God know this in the oldest book of the Bible? How did anybody know this? People saying that Jesuits wrote the Bible to control us and Freemasons. This is long before telescopes. How would they know? Only a God would know this. Now, when I began to dig deeper into Orion, what I found also is that in ancient Aram, which is a region, actually, let's pull up Aram here. This is Aram, and it actually borders Mount Hermon, where the fallen angels came. This is it here in the green area, and it borders Mount Hermon, where the fallen angels came. And according to Orion, or according to Wikipedia here, it says the constellation was known as Nephila. The Nephilim may have been Orion's descendants. So now we have a completely new angle to all of this. It also talks about in here his syncret uh, syncretization of Osiris, and as well as Nimrod, it states in here as well. So they're actually saying that all of these are or could be the same person. Now, this is what is interesting because as I began to look at this in finer detail, I began to notice that many of these names, Nimrod, Osiris, and Orion, have the I-O, the I-O vowel structure. What is the I-O vowel structure? Osiris, O and I. All O's and I's in the word Osiris. Cairo, this is ancient Egypt, but it's spelt C-H-I-R-O, but it's pronounced Cairo. This also, all of the vowels are I's and O's. And of course, Orion. All of the vowels are I's and O's. Now, this must be ringing a bell for some of you that follow this channel. Because what I-O is, is Saturn. I-O, I-O, or Yo, Yo, or Ho, 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 Saturnalia. So now we're beginning to piece these puzzle pieces together and understand what is going on. Let's read Job 9.9 9 and see what they say about Orion here, 
Job. So here we go, Job 9.9. 9. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. Now, obviously, these are star representations of real people that existed on the earth because we begin to understand that the book of Enoch says that we each have a star in heaven that represents our righteousness. We and the angels have a star in heaven. So that's pretty much what I found on Orion, you guys. It goes into more detail here, but I wanted to show you this. We do have somewhat of a connection to Salma Hayek, which is Lebanese, Lebanon. It's interesting because most people believe that she's Mexican, but she's actually Lebanese. Let's pull up Salma Hayek. This would be the place on the map. She was born on six, September 2nd, 1966. Okay, she's saying she's saying she's Mexican here. So maybe I misspoke on that. For some reason I thought that she was Lebanese. Maybe I was looking at a different actress. Things are starting to cross over for me, so disregard that. And let's close some of these windows up. Maybe they changed it. So now let's go on to the next part of the show. I'm going to pop in the chat, see what you guys are up to. What are you chatting about? See uh, Bob's in the house, Dagger Spells, Saving Humanity, Paul Panda, E.P. Emsley, Autumn Kite, Matrix Ministries, Saving Humanity. Oh, I think I already said your name. Thanks, you guys, for showing up tonight. And let's continue on with this to the part two of the show. What washing really means. Now, I was brainstorming with a friend regarding what the word brainwashing and whitewashing meant. We were trying to figure out what the meaning behind the washing is. And when I began to put all this together, it seemed to me as though all of these words are describing the forgetting of something. Okay, Brainwashing, obviously, the forgetting of memory. Whitewashing, the forgetting of the facts surrounding a case or the facts surrounding any type of subject matter. And then I began to understand that when you immerse something in water, remember there's always an evil counterpart to everything good that God does, that we forget. And I begin to think of the words amnesia and how that sounds like amniotic fluid. And amnesia is forgetting, of course. We have money laundering, which means to forget where the money came from. We have scrubbing or washing, forgetting and disappearing. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about that and what this might mean. Guess who forgets our sins when we're washed and we're baptized? Jesus Christ, right? And the Most High. So there's something about the amnesia there's something about the amniotic fluid and i believe that's why we are baptized because it's like remembering is being born again right that's what it's called and everything is forgotten all right i'm going to read in the chat here liam said he was live for two hours baptism all right you guys so then I began to think about this Bible story, the fish who ate the coin. And now this is the most fascinating part of the show, I think, because let's see, let's pull this up. Because I believe we discovered a, a secret. Now, as we all know, Jesus Christ was born. The beginning of the earth age of Pisces. 
This is when he lived on this earth. We just came out of the age of Pisces because it lasts 2,000 years. And now we are in the age of Aquarius. Or we're at the dawning of the age of Aquarius. That's why this, this song came out, right? But Jesus was born at the beginning of the age of Pisces. So this was one of the most fascinating scriptures that I've ever read because it talks about the only time mentioned in the Bible where Jesus paid a tithe or offering. Now, many people have debated this about taxes and paying things to Caesar and all of this, okay? But I begged to differ, and I did mention that on a re-upload that I uploaded this morning, that I believe that that scripture is mistranslated. Give Caesar's things to Caesar and God's things to God, and I'll tell you why. I believe that God does not need your money, and Caesar does. And Jesus was actually making a point. Why do I say that? Because this other scripture that talks about a temple tax seems to corroborate that translation. And we're going to read through that right now. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Now, as we're reading this, I'm going to pull up this image alongside of it. This is unbelievable. As we read this here. And you guys are going to see some deep truth here. Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From who do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? Jesus is asking a question here. From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, and we fall under Jesus, and we are exempt. And for Jesus to prove his point, he basically demonstrated to Simon that all gold comes from God anyway. So he goes, go catch a fish, and he made a miracle, and inside the fish's mouth, there was a gold coin. Now, as you're, I'm reading this story, some of you are already putting the puzzle pieces together, and you're looking on the left-hand side of your screen, and you're beginning to understand that the instructions that, that Jesus gave actually revealed a deep truth that almost no one has discovered to this point. The question will become, who can grasp the truth? Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake, throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Pure seed line, bad blood line. Jesus bridges the gap in the middle. Here's the fish. Where's the coin in his mouth? On the good side. There's your coin, and there is your fish with the coin in its mouth. Now, I don't think anyone's ever looked at this scripture this way before. We're going to go even deeper. Because this is about the two seeds merging with Christ in the middle. Now, Christ is the one that offers us salvation, regardless of what blood is in our veins, regardless of what seed line we are mixed with. We know there were giants after the flood that were from the Nephilim bloodline. Where are they now? They're all mixed with us. That's why the wheats and the tares have to grow up together before the harvest because the blood is mixed. Christ spilled his blood to fix our blood. The fish is in the middle. He's the one who offers us salvation, but we have to believe in him. This is also the two thieves on the cross, you see. So when Jesus took, they asked for two drachmas each. 
he gave them one four drachma coin. He combined the two into one. Now here is what's interesting. We are in fact under, we're in fact exempt of this under the law. The only reason why Jesus paid this tax was not to offend the Caesar, okay? But he said, you are exempt. It says it right here in black and white. We're exempt. Now, Eve bit the apple. She carved out the football. Jesus then came, spilt his blood, and he filled back in the bite that was taken out. Are you seeing this visualized in the Vesica Pisces? And we're going to read in further into this because I actually looked up these drachma coins. This is the tetradrachma. This is the four drachma coin. And there you see the owl. The eyes are also the Vesica Pisces without them being pushed together. In other words, these two are separated in the eyes of the owl. But then Jesus made it from a two drachma coin to a four drachma coin. Maybe that even represents the splitting from the two to the four, but they were both one and the same. Regardless, it seems to be talking about the Vesca Pisces, the owl eyes. Now, this is it. This is a tetradrachma. It's a four drachma coin. They called them owls. They were in mint right around the time Jesus was born, just before the turn of the century, 200 BC. But they were somewhat outdated. But Jesus went back in history and mentioned these drachma coins. They were called little owls throughout the ancient world, an owl in present-day numismatics. The design was kept essentially unchanged for over two centuries, by which time it had become statistically archaic, or stylistically archaic. Now this is a two drachma coin here. And they are similar. Smaller coin, this is all by weight. They were stamped different for different regions. So when people ask you, you know, they use the verse, give Caesar's things to Caesar and God's things to God. You can show them this verse for basically the only reason why Jesus gave his temple tax was not to offend the Caesar, but he, being a child, Peter being a child of Jesus, he was exempt. Now here are all of the drachma coins. Here's the tetradrachma, which is four, and the didrachma, which is two. These particular ones do not have owls on them, but many of them were called owls. This decadrachma, which is ten drachma, actually does have the owl on it. And I believe the owl represents darkness. These uh, owls have a 100% kill rate. And they hunt at night. They're very accurate. They represent the star spin in the night sky, hiding the true glory of heaven because we're locked in this prison cell under the firmament. So we never see the full glory of the stars in heaven and, and all of the heavens and all these things. We also have, we're also watching things through a, a dark lens. How do I know that? Well, some people with cataracts have had their lenses removed. And they actually see the heavens more brilliantly because your lens, when you do a cross section of the lens of your eye, contains these hexagonal honeycomb matrix. And I believe that's why when Jesus healed Saul and scales fell from his eyes, I believe he was talking about that matrix. And that's why he could see. And the same is true today. For people with cataracts, they remove their, their lenses and they can actually see the heavens much more brilliantly. So this is pretty interesting. This goes pretty deep. 
the history of the drachma. And there's probably many, many more clues. But the word originated from a bundle of sticks. It says here, the name drachma is derived from the verb drasome, I grasp. It is believed that the same word with the meaning of handful or handle is found in linear B tablets of the Mycenaean pylos. Initially, a drachma was a fistful, a grasp of six metal sticks, literally spits. So the question becomes, can you grasp this truth? I'm back in the chat. Glad you guys joined the show tonight. See if you guys have any questions. We can open this up for discussion. But I believe that what Jesus was describing was the Vesica Pisces, which represents the union of the fallen ones and the Holy Seed line of Christ and him coming to bridge the gap. The symbol means much different things to the light side than it does to the dark side. The dark side relishes in this union. They want it. They don't want the Savior. Bob asks if this is the separation of cell and life. It, it is the life secret. Yes, it also is the first separation of the cell. It's almost like God is countering. Matrix Ministry says fag, yes, and that's what they call bundle of sticks. So that might mean something as well. What else do we have here? Reading in the chat. 85% kill rate. And who said that? Somebody said that. She was a, uh, a singer from Barbados. They asked her why, she, and the owl was her favorite creature, her favorite animal. And she did a music video, and she's in an owl nest. And she said the owl had 100% kill, kill rate. Let's see here. Marina Bravovich has a pic of her with a bundle of twigs. Wow. The drachma. That's probably what she was representing, run to Christ. Interesting. Jesus is the Vesica Pisces, says E.P. Emsley. I wonder if that is, is that a teaching of the church? Because what I'm seeing is two separate, two separate things. Two separate worlds, two separate cells, two separate bloodlines, two separate seeds merging together with Christ in the middle, the fish, bridging the gap between the two. There's an interesting uh, Bible story about Solomon and these two mothers come and a baby was stolen in the middle of the night and both mothers claim the baby. And Solomon has to decide who is the real mother. And he says... We'll just cut the baby in half. And he knew in his wisdom that God granted him that the real mother would want the child to live and be willing to give up the child. Whereas the false mother would say, go ahead and cut the baby in half. And that's how Solomon determined who the real mother was. And you see, the enemy is much like the bad mother. Because... He wants to see us die before the harvest, whereas the good mother is the one that wants to let the child grow up. That's God's side. Grow up with the bad mother so that she can have life and have a chance to fight evil and fight tendencies and fight negativity. And so that is exactly what God said in his prophecy about the wheat and the tares growing up together it's the same story as the solomon story the wheat and the tares growing up together because they're all connected into one and that's where we're at with that you guys okay i'm reading in the, in the chat here see so identify this thanks identify this appreciate it EPMsley as it says false witness. Maybe you can extra extrapolate on that. I'm 
don't know why the screen isn't showing here. Let's refresh this. Actually, no, we're not going to do that. Wait for that to catch up. Are you guys still seeing screens? Yeah. Uh, yes, you are. Okay, I'm going to close some of these windows. These closed up. Here we are. G uh, Casey, would Jesus have sinned to carry on his bloodline? Um, I don't think no. I don't think uh, I, I'm kind of not under, understanding that question. Maybe you could extrapolate a little bit more. I'm wondering if the bloodline ended with the crucifixion of, of Christ. Right? We had Abraham, David, Solomon. We had, who else do we have in Jesus' bloodline? Of course, the tribe of Judah from the Israelites is where it kind of started. It started with Seth. And so we have this bloodline going all throughout history, the, the Christ bloodline. The enmity between the two seeds, that is what this is. That is what the Vesca Pisces is. It is the enmity between the two seeds spoken about in the book of Genesis. I mean, to me, it's like black and white. It's, yeah, Jesus was perfect. He had no sin. Exactly, Skeeto Punk. I, I, don't, I don't think that... Uh, did he sin because he it said he had no sin? The book talks about Jesus and his relationship to Pisces, says T. Baldwin. If he was sent to save us from our sin, then surely he would not. Yes, friends in truth. Everyone tell me who Simon the twin is, not regular Simon. That is a secret. Anyone know the answer, Casey? No, I don't know the answer to that, Liam. Hey, V3, SAG0. Glad to have you here, too. Shem, thanks, C.P. Emsley. Yes. Shem, we had Seth. They carried the bloodline on the other side, whereas Cain went off and carried the Canaanite bloodline down through history. Which fall like the Philistines, Nimrod, Cush. Um, he came down through the line of Ham after the flood. That was the enemy's bloodline. All of the Ites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, they all came out of that as well. Out of the Philistine dark side bloodline. And they constantly fought against the Israelites. And the Israelites were told not to mingle with them, not to mix with them. And God actually asked them to wage genocide in certain instances against the dark bloodline because the dark bloodline wished to eradicate the line of Christ to come because they knew that a savior was coming. The enemy was working through them to try to eradicate the Israelites. 144K Israelites are the line of David. Uh, yes, that is correct, Matrix Ministries. Yes. They are still, they are the virgins. They call them virgins because they are pure. They are the pure line. They have not been adulterated by the dark seed. But no one really knows who those people are right now. But apparently, some have been preserved. That's pretty cool, Matrix. Your name is Simon. Thank you, EP. Shem was the line after the flood. Absolutely. I get a little confused sometimes. Shem and Seth sound the same, and they probably for good reason because they're in the same bloodline. So it's like a little a brain reminder, I guess. But you'll notice that many of the practices of the Israelites as they were wandering in the wilderness mimicked the life of Christ. He was the lamb who had to be sacrificed. And that's what they did in the wilderness when they were sacrificed. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. Christ was in the wilderness for 40 days, fasting. They were fasting. See how all of it ties together? What were they fasting on? They were fasting on the manna. Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights as well. In case your opinion, would, would the gold in the fish's mouth be our saved souls? Yeah, because that is those that are saved were included in the circle, right, of the fish in the Vesca Pisces. It's in the mouth of the fish. So we become included 
with Christ because we believe in him. It's like when Jesus turned the one thief on the cross and says, because you believe in me, you will be with me in paradise. You see how all that fits together perfectly. If we just think about it and allow the Holy Spirit to open our minds and not be listening to what is progressive or what is comes through a, a pastor's mouth and we discount everything else because we can't believe that God could work through each of us individually to reveal truth. But yet it still happens. Held to your paths. Why 153 fish? We actually covered that on the last show. I'll do a quick recap. It's going to blow your mind. Why 153 fish? This is why. It is the mathematical formula of the center of the Vesica Pisces. It is the fish in the middle. So elegant, so beautiful, yet so simple. He already knew. But yet when you go to church, they talk about God as if he's a third grader. And they never teach you these deeper truths. They never tell you that you are the gold coin in the fish's mouth that has been saved by Christ. You are of him. You do not have to pay the tax. He's paid it for you. He's paid it for you. The gold coin is already in the fish's mouth. Here is the fish, and the gold coin is in his mouth. Simply unbelievable. Now, be careful out there. There are many who will try to say that all of this is simply symbolic, and that Jesus never lived, and so on and so forth. And that is simply not the case. God is so amazing that people actually lived out the future because God knows the beginning from the end. They lived out the truth in their lives. And if you live in God's will, you too have the opportunity to live out God's truth in your life for, for the future. And when people look back in, from in some far distant future, into the past and see all the people that were involved, it will be because you followed God in his instructions. And to me, that's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, I'm glad you guys were able to check out the fishing video. Um, some people ask, is that you? Yeah, that's me. And um, fishing up here on the McCollum River. I'm back in California. I'm kind of glad to be home again where i grew up and was blessed with two german brown trouts i was hitting a little bit of frustration as you guys heard on other videos regarding the put and take of the california fishing game and the, these triploid genetic fish and all the policing going on in the crowds and god blessed me with this quiet little spot all by myself with these beautiful and rare trout and it's like they couldn't stay off my hook and then i knew i was blessed i knew that everything in my life would be okay and it's just how god talks to us through nature take the time get out in nature allow yourself to fall into the natural biorhythms of the outdoors in god's cycles of life pull yourself off of your phones Take a walk, listen to the air as it blows through the canyons and the birds and the trees and try to find that peaceful moment and there you will find truth. And isn't it interesting that I caught two fish, two fish, Pisces. And what are we talking about tonight? And it's amazing how everything always comes full circle. Love you guys. Glad you guys are here. Looks like Ozaro's in a little bit late. He just got the notification. Again, you guys go to the blog spot there. Every time I like a video, you'll automatically get a notification if you follow the blog. Every single time, every single liked video that I like will go to that blog. 
And remember, always click around a bit. Clicking on the ads helps support this channel without having to donate money. So please go do that right now, tonight. And I appreciate all of you guys, and I love you. And we will be back on here very soon. Take care and be safe, you guys.